Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. Great afternoon, brothers and sisters, visitors, all of you here presently and online. It's great to have you here on this first day of the week, celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We're going to do a character study today uh, that occurred after an event. It's actually the second miracle Jesus did at Cana. The first one was turning water into wine at the wedding. And so this is the second one. And along along everything that Jesus did, he did so many things, and we're going to take our time this year to examine a lot of things that Jesus did. And sometimes we're going to examine the people affected, like this official who was greatly affected. And we're going to see what we're going to learn from him today. So open up your Bibles, sit back and relax, and let's get into a Bible study. We're going to ask a question. Where does faith come from, and how is it? that it saves. For many, faith is akin to a wish, like I wish I wish upon a star. Some say faith is superstition or mythical, like believing in Santa Claus or believing in other bedtime stories. That being said, a Christian doesn't automatically have the kind of faith that God really desires. Faith is something that must grow like a plant, like a seed. You're not just satisfied withholding a seed. You plant the seed because you want the fruit from the tree that the seed will give. Just like the plant needs to grow in order to bear fruit, faith as it is in its present form needs to grow in us and needs to continue to grow in order to bear fruit. You can't hurry a plant uh, or demand a tree to give you its fruit. Uh, You have to be very, very patient. Many want to hurry up and grow. When we were younger, maybe we wanted things to happen very quickly. Some of you young folk might be able to relate. You're in a hurry to graduate high school. Then you're in a hurry to graduate college. Then you're in a hurry to get married. What are you in a hurry for? What's the hurry? What's going on? Some may answer, well, I want to be able to do what I want, when I want, how I want. We want to be independent, really, is the answer. But Faith doesn't really grow in that kind of an environment. You can't hurry faith. You heard the song, you can't hurry love, right? Well, on the same token, you can't hurry faith. Faith needs an environment for it to grow adequately. Uh, We need a community of faith in order to help our faith grow. And God works through that community and through our life circumstances, as we're going to see today. In order for faith to grow in righteousness and not just into disappointment, because sometimes we may wish something and we hope for something to happen and our expectations are unfulfilled and so we're disappointed. And sometimes some equate that to faith. Well, I had faith, but it disappointed me. But I'm here to tell you that is not the same thing. That is not faith. Faith is a long-term commitment. Faith does not depend on your expectations of what something will happen. Faith is something that needs to mature through the experiences that God gives you. God tests you to see what are you going to do with the experiences and the choices that he presents to see whether or not you're going to trust him because faith is ultimately trusting God, not trusting our expectations, not trusting the results that we might see. It is really a trust in God. And when you read throughout the Bible, like we did last year, I hope that that was something that you clearly saw, that all of the things that happened in the past happened to teach us, as the New Testament tells us, to teach us to imitate the good, to stay away from those things that brought about bad results because of bad choices, and to ultimately just trust in God. God gives us opportunities because God wants our faith to grow. He really wants the faith 
that we have to grow into a faith that pleases him. And so a faith that results in righteousness because we really are following Christ. If you choose to be like your old self throughout all these opportunities presented to you, then the faith takes a step back. It shrinks. It shrivels. If you choose to respond like Jesus, then the faith grows. Your faith will grow as you own it, as you live by its hope, as you live by its conviction. And an earnest desire to please God who justified you by his son's blood. So depending on who you're earnestly seeking to please, your faith is going to grow and become strong or it's going to shrink back and become weak. We're going to be looking at John chapter 4 verses 46 through 53. So you might want to turn there. That's where our main text is going to be. It's a short account. But there's a lot to learn about how faith develops. We're going to be looking at the stages of faith. And we're going to notice how this royal official that meets Jesus in this occasion. We're going to notice how Jesus takes his faith and allows it to grow. And the instance that we're going to be looking at, it's not a long instance. It's a short instance. Perhaps a couple of days. Not even a week. The span of time that we're looking at. So I want to let you know that all these things that you're going to see that happen in this week may sometimes take years, decades for us to accomplish some of these stages in our walk with Christ. And if you're still alive, that means you're not done yet. Okay, that's where we need to trust God. So let's start reading here in verse 46. I'm going to be reading from the God's Word translation. Jesus returned to the city of Cana in Galilee where he had changed water into wine. A government official was in Cana. His son was sick in Capernaum. I had trouble pronouncing that. I want to say Capernaum, but that is totally wrong. It's Capernaum. <laughs> the official heard that Jesus had returned from Judea to Galilee. So he went to Jesus and asked him to go to Capernaum with him to heal his son who was about to die. Here, we're, we see that this man had some kind of belief. You know, he approaches Jesus after all. Perhaps he had heard from other people that Jesus would be able to help him in this situation. So here we see the stage one of faith, a basic belief. The official simply believed that Jesus had some kind of power, absent from any personal experience, to justify his faith. He simply demonstrated that he believed that Jesus would come with him to heal his son. After all, he probably had heard that Jesus had done that many times over in other occasions. His faith at this point required the visual presence of Jesus. His faith required sight. It required him to see Jesus and for Jesus to go with him somewhere. And that's where most of our faith is at. Most of us have a visual faith. It's a faith in what we commonly put our trust in every day. And if we don't make it grow, if we don't cause it to grow, it's kind of going to stay at this stage. And you're going to experience, experience great disappointments in life because you can't see results. And that's why the disappointments come. It stays uh, truncated at this stage. Think about this. I mean, you get into an airplane and fly. Why? Because you've seen other people do it. And some people are terribly afraid of getting into a plane or sometimes even a car because maybe they recently experienced an issue. You may not understand how the airplane flies. You might not even be able to explain the laws of physics that allow it to fly. But you see other people do it. You see that they get out of it fine. And we talk about it every day. And so you say, sure, why not? I'll, I'll fly. I'll get into an airplane. Many others use Jesus kind of like an amulet. You know, they need something visual. Cross, perhaps. A ring of some sort. Maybe even a Bible. Or something physical. And their faith depends on having that. You ever heard of the people keeping the lucky rabbit's foot? The lucky coin? Well, sometimes people say that they have faith in Christ, but they need something visual, uh, something that I can sense 
in order for the faith to work. Some would say that that is kind of superstitious. I would tend to agree with that. Kind of like the same faith people have in horoscopes, right? Uh, A faith that depends on what is seen. It's okay to start at this point because that's where we're going to start, to be honest with you. It's okay to start, but this is just the beginning. From here on, the faith needs to grow. Otherwise, you're going to be greatly disappointed. You're going to find it really hard to obey God because of ignorance or because of bias. Your heart and your passions are going to win out every single time if your faith doesn't grow from this point. Because your passions are going to be stronger than that. Paul talks about this a lot in Romans. He, talks, he says in Romans, he starts talking about true faith or righteousness by faith in Romans chapter 10, verse 6. I'm not going to really get into it. But he paraphrases in this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, to point out to the Jews that he was writing to their lack of faith concerning the Messiah because their faith was very visual. Think about this. We read through Deuteronomy and Exodus and how they, you know, all they had to do was go outside their tent and they could see the mountain of God and they could see the lightning and they could see the smoke and they could see the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And some of you would say, hey, you know, if it was that easy, I, I'd had faith too. But did they have faith? <laughs> we know that they, they struggled even with all those visual things, even remembering the Red Sea parting. What does that tell us about that visual component? Is it necessary to have? Absolutely not. It's not going to help you at all, actually. It won't help you at all develop your faith. So we have to understand that. Paul, in that passage, (laughs) asked asked them, uh, who can go up to heaven? You know, who knows where God is? Or who knows if hell is real? Some people will ask. But it's not faith. At that point, but doubt that is being expressed. And Paul goes on to say that righteousness that is by faith is not far away. He says, it's not in a mountain that I have to go get it. It's not across a river that I have to go get it. Quoting Deuteronomy. He says, no, it's near. It's right here. He says, it's right in your heart and it's in your mouth. It involves keeping God's word in your mouth and in your heart. And that's when he goes to say in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the message. And the message is the word of Christ, the saving gospel message. This reminds me of Acts 17, verse 26 and 27, where Paul, in preaching at the Areopagus to many unbelievers, said from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history, the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so they will seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. God is in control. He's doing all these things. He is not far from us, trying to help our faith grow. He meets us where we're at. And he's going to do stuff in your life to help you get from stage one to the next stages of your faith. What's on you is you've got to keep your eyes open because you will see the results of faith. The results of faith are measurable. They are. You just got to keep your eyes open. You just need to get rid of preconceived ideas to get to the next stage of faith. The kind that grows to please God. We know in the parable of the sower that three out of the four soils received the word of God. And and grew even into something that was perceivable. A plant. Granted, They didn't grow into producing fruit. Only one did. But the others grew somewhat. The faith grew, but it wasn't enough. What does that that tell us? Stage one is not enough. We need to grow. There needs to be a growth in in order for us to get to the stage of bearing fruit. Now, here comes the tough part. In order for faith to grow... It needs to be challenged. It's not going to be easy. (laughs) I wish there was some easy formula, but it's not. It has to be tested. It's kind of like what David said. You know, there was a point in time where there was a plague in Israel 
And uh, the angel of the Lord stopped the plague at a specific point. And David had to make a sacrifice. He had to buy the land from somebody to build an altar and make a sacrifice on it. And the guy who owned the land says, here, I'm going to give it to you. Go and do what you need to do. And David says, and I, I'm, don't give it to me. I have to pay for this. I'm not going to offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. David had the right idea. Faith that costs you nothing is not faith. It's going to cost you something. And the cost, as well as the results of faith, are measurable. And you'll, and you'll feel it too. <laughs> that's real faith. And that's the faith that's going to take your level of growth and commitment to a whole new level. In fact, Jesus tells the official this, his response, when he comes and tries to tell the man, when the man says, Jesus, you know, you, you just got to come with me. I picture the man grabbing him by the arm and saying, you got to come with me to, to, to Capernaum to, to heal my son, Jesus. And Jesus is looking at him. And then he says, if people don't see miracles and amazing things, they won't believe. And the official said to him, sir, come. You know, he, he went over his head. Come. You got to come with me right now. It's disturbing to Jesus. This is not the first time he says something like this. But it's disturbing to Jesus that signs are required for belief. In contrast to this, the Galileans and Samaritans in chapter 4, verse 41, it says they believed because of his word. So sometimes Jesus is going to have great results. He's going to be happy, kind of like with the centurion. Remember the, Ro the Roman centurion who had great faith? As a matter of fact, Jesus says, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. It was even surprising to Jesus. But that was not this case. But John talks about how this nobleman didn't dispute necessarily Jesus' statement about his lack of faith. He was just desperate. He was a desperate father, and there was a deep sense of urgency in his plea. And it's important to note that the father does not have the faith that Jesus is able to do what he is requesting. Jesus knew what this man needed. And so his reply was one that the man was not going to like. Go home. Go home. Your son will live. But something happens. The man believed what Jesus told him. And he left. Wow. Something happened. He stepped out. At first, he was tugging on Jesus, wanting Jesus to come with him. I mean, he had to believe in Jesus in order to do that. But then he hears from Jesus a different story, a different answer. Go home. Your son will live. And so maybe the man had to think about that and say, well, gee, you know, if I came all this way because I believe this guy can do something, then I should listen to this guy too if he tells me what I did not expect. He didn't need that much encouragement to do it because the man did leave. It's not like the case of Naaman, remember Naaman, where he was told something that he didn't expect. He said, surely I thought the man of God would come out and wave his hands or do some kind of abracadabra on me and I would be healed. But to go to this river, you know, which river makes a difference? I can just go to the river in my own country. Why does that river have to be? And he went away angry, the scripture says in Kings. But if it were not for somebody who loved him very much and said, Father, if the prophet would have asked you to do something really hard, you would have done it. Why not go and be washed seven times? And the guy listened. He was humbled and his faith grew. But in this case, he doesn't need that much encouragement. Jesus tells him, go, your son is going to live. At that point, maybe he was uh, torn. But Jesus, you know, you need to be there. But he's saying this, what should I do? Okay, I'm going to go. His faith was challenged at that point. How many of you want to hear something? You go and ask for advice, hoping that you would hear one kind of advice, but the other kind of advice comes out of that person's mouth. And now you're torn. What should I do? Well, this man showed that he was able to go to the next stage of faith 
at that point, the next challenge. His faith was provoked and he accepted the challenge. He said, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust your words. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? To get to the next stage, something has to happen in your life. Well, now this trust of Jesus is going to be put to the test. And you're going to have to do something that maybe either you don't think you can do or wasn't what you ex expected to do. But this is the crossroads, isn't it? What are you going to do at this point? God has already given us the tools to live by real faith, as I shared with you, as Paul sh shared in Romans chapter 10. They involve the mouth. They involve the heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tell us, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That belief, that conviction in your heart that God raised him from the dead is necessary in order for you to have a saving faith. It's a trust in the accounts that happen in history. And the amazing thing is that these accounts are verifiable. You don't have to go far to learn about them. You don't have to go climb a mountain or cross a river or go to the bottom of the ocean. But these are events in history that have happened and that are easily verifiable. It's not that hard to believe that God raised them from the dead. What's going to be harder is what follows that, is trusting God now to lead your life. But here are the basics to believe and to confess. What is it that comes out of our mouths? He says here, declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess your faith in our Savior. There's a connection here between the mouth and the heart. What is that connection? What comes out of your mouth? Well, if you live by faith only, Jesus is going to come out. The things that Jesus said, you're going to do the things that Jesus did. You're going to want to live that way following in his, in his footsteps. But if you're pleasing the flesh, and if that's what you're holding dear in your heart, that's also going to come out of your mouth. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. What is in your heart right now? What is in your heart? What is tugging at you? Are you full of unfulfilled desires that are probably going to come to nothing or could be the death of you? Are you full of longing or persistence in seeking Glory, honor, and immortality in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Romans 2, 7, and 8. You will get what you want. That's God's promise. You will get what you want. You want the world? You want the riches of the world? You want the pleasures of the world? You might get it. But the question is, are you willing to sell your soul for that? And what's going to happen in the afterlife? You're going to be kicking yourself. Or do you want to see glory, immortality, and honor that comes from Jesus? You'll get, you'll get that too, if that's what you want to seek. Romans 2, verse 6 through 11, tell us, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good, see glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth, and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. This is a promise. But there's another promise, the opposite of this, that is just as true. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. You just got to make a decision in your heart. What am I going to do? And I'm, am I going to trust Jesus? And am I going to trust that he's got my best interest at heart and not trust myself? That's what it really comes down to. Those are the questions at every corner, at every challenge that precede the stages of growth in faith. So, yes, the man did believe Jesus. The evidence that he believed him is what? He left. <laughs> he left. 
He went to Capernaum. Capernaum, sorry, I keep pronouncing it the wrong name. So while the official was on his way to Capernaum, his servants met him and told him that the boy was alive. The official asked them at what time his son got better. That's something I would have done. The servants told him the fever left him yesterday evening at 7 o'clock. And the boy's father realized that it was the same time Jesus had told him, your son will live. So the official and his entire family became believers. So the next stages of growth, or, or the next stages of faith, sorry, are all right here in this passage. Stage three. Here's the stage three of uh, faith. It's, it's concrete evidence. And God, man, God is so good to us that he acquiesces. He wants us to see the concrete evidence of our faith. There's even one passage that says that if Jesus doesn't answer our, answer our prayers, Will he expect faith when he comes back? So even Jesus is aware of that. And he doesn't leave our prayers and our dependence on him unanswered. He wants to answer them because he knows that that's how faith is going to grow. And we see that right here. You know, the servants presented two important facts to the official, which led to that concreteness of faith. They told him that his son was alive. Just as Jesus had said, your son will live. And they told him that the healing occurred at a definite point in time. One o'clock. Uh, one o'clock, the NIV will say, the seventh hour. This one says seven o'clock. So the man, you know, quickly did his mental calculations, realizing that that was the very hour Jesus had said to him, your son will live. He knew it was how Jesus said it that it would be, that his son would be living. He knew it was when Jesus said it would occur at a certain hour. So all of the sudden, he owned his faith by this evidence. It was like a light bulb going off in his head based on something tangible, something observable. And so he was on to his next stage of faith. And those who live by this kind of faith, once you get to this stage in your faith, you're going to start seeing different things. You're going to all of a sudden become aware of God doing things in your life because you'll realize that God leaves some kind of tangible evidence for you as a reward for trusting him in all that you do. I can tell you, I mean, I could go on in many stages of my life. And, and probably everything that you can see about my life, anything that you could see related to me that you could say, well, that is a good thing. It all has come from God. All the tangible things. They have been a concrete answer to my prayers. Those who live by this faith, you, they hold on to his word even more so because they learn to trust him at a different level and earnestly seek him first now and everything that they do. It's not just, a, it can't be just a one-time thing, but it becomes like, a, I don't know, like, like an adventure. Like, yeah, I can't wait to see how God's going to answer this now. You know, now it's a challenge, but it's a good one. Not one that would cause fear. Oh boy, I wonder what's going to happen next. But one that is exciting. Oh, what is God going to do with our children? You know, some of you are, are fearful about that. <laughs> but you got to get to this stage where you're like excited because God has brought us this far. And he's going to work with everyone who wants to work with him. Asking God, praying to God that you don't be, that you won't be corrupted by greed or by hatred or by pride because we know all those things blind us. To trusting Jesus. And it's so easy to get corruptible by our heart's desires. So yes, at every corner of my life, I was presented with this challenge. Was I going to be able to graduate college? At one point, I didn't know if that was going to happen. I sincerely doubted that I would graduate. And after seven years, yes, seven years. Yeah, that's why I doubted, right? <laughs> so I was like, I don't see the end. <laughs> I don't see the light. Am I going to be in here forever? And boy, that was a test of my faith. Finding a job after I got fired. 
staying pure, denying my passions while I waited for God to bless me with a wife. Ooh, that was hard. That was tough. And then meeting my wife and then not being afraid of taking the steps. Not being afraid of being burnt again. <laughs> that are required trust in God. And many other instances. But you begin to see evidence of the unseen in all of this. And it becomes so clear because you know you're denying yourself. And you're let, giving room for God to give an answer. That's how you know it's going to be God. Because it's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You say, well, I want to do this, but I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to let God do his thing. It requires patience and it requires trust. But then when God does his thing, he always blows you away. He always gives you more than what you're willing to put at stake. Twice, three times, four times. You're like, whoa. And then some. Those who live by this faith realize that there is an, an incredible power at work in us. A power that enables us to pursue this faith and to trust because we know Jesus overcame. This is the victory, John says, that has overcome the world. Our faith. We have overcome. We're just kind of here, you know, filling our time. But we're done. We did it. We did it. Do yourselves in. <laughs> we're done. Now we're just waiting for Jesus to be revealed. That's really it. What else is there to do? Honestly. So that's why we make every effort, as Peter encourages us to do, to add to our faith, he says. This is what is required for faith to go. You have to add to it, he says. Make every effort to add goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness. And mutual affection and above all love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's stage three. Stage four. Notice what happened here. Now that the man was convinced, he was convinced, he had the evidence to believe, he realized that he was rewarded for coming to Jesus. Even though Jesus says, go home. Even though the interaction was very little. He believed in Jesus' goodness. In his love, in his faithfulness. He was convinced now that Jesus was for him. That Jesus wasn't there to condemn him or reject him. He knows he is welcome in the eyes of Christ. And this is the confidence the author of Hebrews talks about. In Hebrews 11.1. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for. The assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. He will say in verse 6 of the same chapter. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is the victory of our faith. We have overcome as Jesus overcame. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for our behalf. There's a security at that stage. I know I'm loved. I don't have to prove myself to anybody. I know who I am. I accept who I am. As flawed as I am, I accept it. I don't have anything to prove because God has accepted me. And I don't say that to say, yeah, accept me as I am. Don't expect me to improve. I'm not saying it that way. I'm saying I'm accepting myself because that is the root problem of unbelief. We don't accept ourselves. And so we play a game. Isn't that, that, that's social media right there. It's a game we play because we don't like who we are or we don't accept who we are. And we have to do, we have to be someone else. I have to be something that I find more attractive than the person who God made me. And we change our appearances. We change our hairstyles. We even go and change our gender. Why? What's the point? Accept who you are. But see, you won't get there unless you're at stage four. Unless you've been tested. 
and you've believed that Jesus is for you and has accepted you. And so after stage four, we get to stage five, which is the last stage here, which is the last sentence, the official and his entire family became believers. When you're at stage five, you spread your faith. Now you're that tree that has borne fruit, and now the fruit other people can take and enjoy. Now you can share your faith because you're totally convinced. I'm not trying to sell you something. You know, I'm not trying hard to prove my point. I'm, I, am, I just am as he is, and this is his love. And people can see that genuineness in you if you're at this point. They can see that you really believe, that this is who you are, and they'll treat you differently. And they'll even ask you for prayers. That has happened to many of you, right? Somebody that I don't know just came to me and all of a sudden wanted to tell me the story of his life. I says, well, what do I look like? <laughs> Why are you doing this? Pray, pray for me, they say. People at your job, they come up to you, pray for me. And you know so there's something different about you and you haven't said anything. That happens all the time. I know because you tell me about it. And that's just evidence that you're at this point. You're letting God work in your life. And this man, you know, he believed and he spread it to his family. This belief leads to action. It's a conviction now that you're confessing. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And now you confess your faith. This is now the heart and the mouth working together. You will be saved. That's what the Lord promises, right? John 1, 12 through 13 says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. This is what it means to be born again. I like what this passage says here, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. But notice what I underlined there. We are convinced. I'm convinced Jesus died. I'm convinced he was raised. If I'm convinced, I will die. I'm dead. I'm dead. There's nothing to live for anymore for me. Now I live for Christ. But it has to come from that conviction that he died for all, and therefore all died. He died that those who should live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is stage five faith. Full of the love of God, living for Christ. And let me tell you something. This doesn't mean that you're not going to have any more passions or desires to do all kinds of other things. That doesn't mean that at all. I have to fight those things every day. There's a hundred million things that I would like to do. But that I have to remind myself, what for? <laughs> I'm, I'm dead to that. What is that going to accomplish? And then I have to remind myself who I am, what I've been set apart for. It's a constant battle. Yeah, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. You know, I, I want to do the things I shouldn't do, and the things I should do, I don't want to do. Yes, you're going to even be there at stage 5. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was just sharing himself. In those chapters, sharing about that war, like the song says, I'm at war with myself. Oh, yeah, that is a real war right there. But you got to recognize that. Don't try to just change yourself or make yourself into something that you would wish to be and live a pretend life. That's not how you deal with it. That's completely fake. And people will see right through it. Other fake people can spot fake people right away. The question is that we need to be authentic people. But in order to do that, we have to accept who God made us and be okay with that so that now we can grow into those people who can please Him. That is a tough challenge for this generation. But nonetheless, one that God has equipped you to overcome in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So understanding the mission of Jesus Understanding the mission of God's son, which was to become a man, offering his life 
as an atoning sacrifice to bridge that gap, as uh, Robert was saying in the lesson, to bridge that gap for us. Because by ourselves, all that we would end up doing is the same thing everybody has done in all of history. Try to live a fake life. Try to live a pretend life of some sort. And at the end, dying bitterly and lonely and full of regret. That's what, that's what it happened. And that would, what happens to many. But God wanted to change that and offer us something else. Offer us true life. Full life. Life to the full. As it says in John 10.10. 10. We may not have known the trouble that we're in. And sometimes we don't recognize that. Since we treat sin so lightly. We dance with it. We play with it. We dance with the devil in the pale moonlight. Not even knowing. But God's son, one of the things that he does through his word, he makes us aware of that so that we know not to play around with fire. And he gives us new life, new hope, a concrete faith. And when we believe this gospel and are convinced, convicted by God's love for us and how he chose us, knowing how intrinsically evil we are any way he chooses us, he loves us like a father loves his son. We're convinced by that. Then we must take that first step to join Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that first step is called baptism. That's your first step in self-denial. To step into the first stage of faith right there. That's the first stage. I got to die to self. And you die and you buried with Jesus in water. And as he came out from the grave, you come up in newness of life. That's the first step of the journey. A participation in the good news. And so here we have them summed up. The stages of faith. As shown here by this official. And this happened to him maybe in the course of five days. Less than a week. But to us, it's a lifetime. You know? And sometimes we get to stage five. And we're sharing the good news. And something happens. Boom! We get hit with a two by four. Maybe that knocks up that. Not, knocks us back to stage three again. And we're like, oh, okay, <laughs> what happened here? You know, I think COVID did that to many. I think the pandemic knocked you back a few steps. And if that has happened to you, acknowledge it. It says, what am I afraid of? What am I doing? And step back up in front. Because God is in control. Step back up. Own the victory that Jesus has won for you. Own it. It's yours. But you got to believe it. And then let's start spreading that good news again. So this episode describes the growth of faith, the nature of faith, perhaps. When the official realized Christ could be trusted with his son, that made him commit himself more to Jesus. Eventually, that led to a concrete faith, which eventually led for him to spread his faith. And now his whole family could enjoy this faith. The Gospel of John, the whole Gospel of John was written to establish precisely this kind of faith. The faith that saves. That's what he says in John 20, 30 and 31. And these man's steps of faith, these simple stages were rewarded every time he was willing to meet them. Every time he was willing to step out of his comfort zone, he was rewarded. With that concrete evidence. Jesus proved worthy of his faith. Will you let him prove himself worthy to you? Will you do that today? Will you do that this week? Because if, if you believe him, you will receive eternal life. Take him at his word. God bless you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.